good morning we'll begin with uh, girish kanar's uh, play naga mandala uh, subtitle play with a cobra the key words in today's lecture would be folk theater meta theater mythical elements in uh, girish kanar's plays and brechtian techniques as employed by girish kanar uh, so like all traditional plays uh, kanar is uh, extremely uh, fond of using traditional uh, structure and techniques in his plays um, he uh, is uh, obviously inspired by the modernists like strindberg and brecht but uh, he also occasionally looks up to the uh, classical sanskrit theater from our country and uh, prologue is one way of uh, asserting that so the use of prologue so consider the set and the tone and the mood in the first lines itself it's extremely surrealistic it's the inner sanctum of a ruined temple look at the stage directions all given in italics the idol is broken so the presiding deity of the temple cannot be identified now we are looking at the unidentifiable nature of objects okay it's a broken uh, idol okay it's it cannot be identified and more will come it's night Na naturally uh, it's night so you can't really identify whose idol it is and it's also broken moonlight seeps in through the cracks in the roof and the walls now imagine a play where moonlight seeping in through the cracks in the wall and the roof a man is sitting in the temple long silence suddenly he opens his eyes wide closes them then uses his fingers to pry open his eyelids obviously he is very sleepy he is forcing his eyelids to remain open then he goes back to his original morose stance he yawns involuntarily then reacts to the yawn by shaking his head violently and turns to the audience so now this ad technique of addressing the audience face to face is very brechtian okay we uh, 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 brecht uses that uh, uh, technique of alienate alienation effect okay the which is uh, uh, in order to uh, you know make the familiar unfamiliar and vice versa okay so uh, addressing that uh, audience directly was one of the features or one of the characteristics of uh, the alienation effect we'll look at it in detail soon the man addresses the audience i may be dead within the next few hours i'm not talking of acting dead so you, you see there is a reference to acting okay he is talking to the audience and he's telling the audience that uh, it's a play okay so a play is going on but but i am real i am not an actor i won't be acting dead you know when they pretend to uh, act dead on stage or in a film but he's not going to act dead he's actually going to die on stage actually dead i might die right in front of your eyes a mendicant mendicant is a sage a beggar mm, you must keep awake at le- um, mendicant told me you must keep awake at least one whole night this month if you can do that you will live if not you will die on the last night of the month i laughed out loud when i heard him i thought nothing would be easier than spending a night awake i was wrong perhaps death makes one sleepy every night this month i have been dozing off before even being aware of it i am convinced i am seeing something with these eyes of mine only to wake up and find i was dreaming tonight is my last chance for tonight is the last night of the month so see look at the uh, suspense he has been told he has been cursed that uh, unless he stays awake one full night uh, within uh, a month uh, he cannot uh, expect to uh, go on living and today is the last night of the month and uh, for some reason or the other he has been dozing off every night of the month and today he has no other choice but to remain awake and that's the problem <clears throat> for tonight is the last month night of the month even of my life perhaps because if i don't stay awake the whole night um i'm going to die for who how do i know sleep won't creep in on me again as it has every night so far i may doze off right in front of you and that will be the end of me 
I asked the mendicant what I had done to deserve this fate and he said, you have written plays. So, the nature of writing, the nature of being a writer is now discussed here. You have written plays, you have staged them, you have caused so many good people who came trusting you to fall asleep twisted in miserable chairs. That is a writer's dilemma, that is the playwright's curse. People come, people uh, expect something uh, from a playwright and if they feel they are not being entertained enough, uh, they get bored and um, here we are told that uh, people come uh, trusting you to keep them entertained. But uh, what do your plays do to them? It makes them fall asleep, twisted in miserable chairs and that all that abused mass of sleep has turned against you and become the curse of death. I had not realized my plays had had that much impact. You know, Karnad is a, a, has a, a fondness for using folk, uh, elements from folk theatre and this, uh, this is a, a Kannada folk tale, where uh, a writer is cursed with uh, uh, you know, curse of death, you know, uh, uh, by, by uh, and he is cursed to sleep every night. Okay, so, this uh, this is actually a folk tale which is used by Karnan um, to you know uh, to a wonderful effect in this particular play. So, uh, Karnan as we were talking about, he uses time and again uh, elements from uh, folk theatre, um, from uh, our regional theatre and then he employs them and then he uh, not only uh, asserts or reasserts the uh, thematic elements as contained in those folk tales, but also subverts the, uh, the contemporary trends, the contemporary established notions um, about many things, about uh, gender issues, about social issues, about socio political issues. So, using elements from folk theatre while asserting their uh, essence, uh, at the same time subverting them and interrogating the contemporary themes and issues. So, that is what he is doing here. Tonight may be my last night. So, I have fled from home and come to this temple, nameless and empty. So, that is the very nature of the uh, place. The place itself is nameless, it is empty, the idol is broken, there is not enough light. Okay. That could, uh, that is a good commentary on uh, the writer's life as well. For years, I have been lording it over my family as a writer. I could not bring myself to die a writer's death in front of them. So, he is being very ironical here, writer's death. He uh, has bored people and therefore, he is going to be cursed with death, a writer's death. I swear by this absent God, if I survive this night, I shall have nothing more to do with themes, plots or stories. So, he has taken a wow, God just let me live. And from tonight, I will not be writing anything um, anymore. I abjure all story telling, all play acting. Female voices are heard outside the temple. He looks, voices here at this time of night, lights. Who could be coming here now? He hides behind a pillar, several flames enter the temple, giggling, talking to each other in female voices. So, now uh, look. Um, uh, According to Aristotle, uh, when he talks about uh, you know uh, his theory of poetics and drama, so um, he talks about uh, he uses a term like probable impossibility. Now, it is impossible to have flames coming and talking, you know, flames coming as females and uh, taking a female form and coming and talking, uh, looking, uh, you know, taking the form and shape of a woman, but uh, here they are and it is a play and it is and it's a story and we are supposed to accept that and that is what we are talking about, Aristotelian concept of probable impossibility. So, why not? In a story, everything is possible and therefore, um, you know, willing suspension of disbelief, that is what is happening. We have to accept that, 
that flames can come and take a feminine shape and talk. Man, I do not believe it, they are naked lamp flames, no wicks, no lamps, no one holding them, just lamp flames on their own. Floating in the air, is that even possible? Another three or four flames enter, talking among themselves. Flame three, addressing flame one, which is already in the temple. Um, hello, what a pleasant surprise, you are here before us tonight, uh, flame one. The master of our house, you know, what a skin flint he is. He is convinced his wife has a hole in her palm like she is a spendthrift. So, he buys all the groceries himself. This evening, before the dark was uh, even an hour old, they ran out of cushy oil. The tin of peanut oil did not go far, the bowl of castor oil was empty anyway. So, they had to retire to bed early and I was permitted to come here. Laughter. Flame to sneering, cushy oil, peanut oil, how disgusting. My family come from the coast, we will not touch anything but coconut oil. Flame 1, but at least I come here every night. What about your friend, the kerosene flame? She has not been seen here for months. She is one of the first tonight. You know, the uh, Karnad is uh, very cleverly commenting on the uh, Indian caste system, the famed Indian caste system, where there is a hierarchy among people of different castes. And here too, even among flames, you have a kind of hierarchy. So, you have uh, the cushy or the flame which is, uh, uh, which, which goes on, on the basis of cushy oil. Then you have a, a flame which burns with the peanut oil. And then kerosene is the, uh, uh, is at the bo bottom of the hierarchy. And, uh, a coconut, the flame which uses uh, coconut oil is uh, perhaps it belongs to the higher order. So, um, they are all discussing their status, their hierarchies, their positions in society. Actually, from today on, I do not think I will have any difficulty getting out and early. Why? What has happened? Um, my master had an old ailing mother. Her stomach was bloated, her back covered with bad sores. The house stank of cough and phlegm, pus and urine. No one get, got a wink of sleep at night. Naturally, I stayed back too. The old lady died this morning, leaving behind my master and his young wife. I was chased out fast. Okay, so, uh, this is again a reference to uh, you know the, the, the physical pleasures of a hus between a husband and wife and that also tells you um, uh, you know, that it sets the tone of the play, what the play is all about. Okay? So, you can expect from this conversation, the, uh, the tone, the essence of the play. Uh, all flames giggle. Flame 3, you are lucky, my master's eyes have to feast on his wife limb by limb, if the rest of him is to react. So, we lambs have to bear a witness to what is better left to the dark. They all talk animatedly. New flames come and join them. They group and regroup, chattering. Man to the audience. Now again, this talking directly to the audience. Okay, a very Brechtian technique. I had heard that when lamps are put out in the village, the flames gather in some remote place and spend the night together gossiping. So this is where they gather. A new flame enters and is enthusiastically greeted. You are late, it is well past midnight. New flame, ah, there was such a to do in our house tonight. What happened? Tell us. New flame, you know, uh, I have only an old couple in my house. Tonight, the old woman finished eating, swept and cleaned the floor, put away the pots and pans and went to the room in which her husband was sleeping. And what should she see? But a young woman dressed in a rich new sari step out of the room. The moment the young woman saw my mistress, she ran out of the house and disappeared into the night. The old woman woke her husband up and questioned him, but he said he knew nothing, which started the rumpus. So, there is a mysterious person in the house, but who was the young woman? Others, other flames ask. How did she get into your house? New flame, let me explain. My mistress, the old woman, knows a story and a song, but all these years she has kept them to herself, never told the story nor sung the song, 
So, the story and the song were being choked, imprisoned inside her. This afternoon, the old woman took her usual nap after lunch and started snoring. The moment her mouth opened, the story and the song jumped out and hid in the attic. At night, when the old man had gone to sleep, the story took the form of a young woman and the song became a sari. The young woman wrapped herself in the sari and stepped out, just as the old lady was coming in. Thus, the story and song created a feud in the family and were revenged on the old woman. Now, see, this is again what we are talking about uh, Aristotle's impossibility, uh, probable Im Im uh, impossibility. And again, taking elements from our own folk tales and mythology. If you suppress a story, uh, it gets stifled inside. So, stories are for telling to people. We are talking about the uh, you know, oral story tradition, or, uh, uh, storytelling and the oral uh, orality of stories in our country. So, stories have to be told, not to be suppressed. So, we need, if there is a story inside, let it be told. Okay. Stories uh, can survive uh, only by way of oral tradition. They have to be uh, transmitted from one generation, from one person to another, from one generation to another. Okay. Because you learn a lot from your uh, folk and mythical uh, traditions. Okay. And this woman, this old lady who had a story inside her, she has committed a cardinal sin. She has suppressed a story, which she is not supposed to do. And there was a song also. So, you know, it is all, these are all parts of our oral traditions, our folk traditions, stories and songs. And the moment the, uh, uh, they had the opportunity, both the story and the song, they came out and turned into a young woman dressed in a in a resplendent sari, and there was a feud over that. So stories also have the power, have the uh, you know power, to create a feud feud in the family, to create uh, cause a commotion in the family. That's the power of a story. So if you tell them it's a, there is a problem, if you suppress them, there may be uh, it may be worse. They have to be told, and they have to be passed on from one generation to another. So, if you try to gag one story, another happens. Flames, but where are they now, the poor things? How long will they run around in the dark? They are referring to the uh, story and the song. What will happen to them? New flame, I saw them on my way here and told them to follow me and they should be here any moment. There they are, the story with the song. The story in the form of a woman dressed in a new colorful sari enters acknowledges the enthusiastic welcome from the flames with a languid wave of the hand and goes and sits in a corner looking most despondent. The flames gather around her. New flame, come on, why are you so despondent? We are here and uh, are free the whole night. We will listen to you. Story, thank you my dears, it is kind of you, but what is the point of your listening to a story? You cannot pass it on. Flames, that is true, what can we do? I wish we could help. While the flames make sympathetic noises, the man, you know, who is sitting there, jumps out from behind the pillar and grabs the story by her wrist. Man, I listen to you. The flames flee, helter skelter in terror. The story struggles to free herself. <coughs> who are you? Let me go. Man, what does it matter who I am? I will tell, I listen to you. Is not that enough? I promise you, I listen all night. The story stops struggling. There is a new interest in her voice. You will? Yes, good. Then let me go. He does not. I need my hands to act out the parts. He lets her go. There is a condition, however. What? You can't just listen to the story and leave it at that. You must tell it again to someone else. So, see, this is the nature of a story. It has to be told and retold. It is not for uh, uh, you know, it is not anyone's property, that is the, that is the charm of, a, uh, of oral literature, of folk theater, of folk tales. They, they have to be passed on and you have to narrate it to someone, you have to retell it to someone, that is the only condition. I am going to tell you my story. 
uh, that I certainly shall, if I live, but first I must be alive to, oh, that reminds me, I have a condition too. Yes, I must no, not doze off during the tale, if I do, I die. All your telling will be wasted. Story, as a self-respecting story, that is the least I can promise. All right then, um, start, uh, but no, uh, it is not possible, I take back my word, I cannot repeat the story. You see, he has taken a vow, if he goes on to live that night, he is going to abjure all plot making, all storytelling, all playwriting and he has taken a vow and he cannot break that. And why not? I have just now taken a vow not to have anything to do with themes, plots or acting. If I live, I do not want to risk my more curses from the audience. Goodbye then, we must be going. So, Karnad may as well be commenting on his own craft, his craft of play telling, plot developing, okay, that uh, he is extremely conscious of the fact that uh, some members of the audience may get bored with what he has to say and he apologizes, okay, he is aware. So, this consciousness uh, you know, the, uh, of a playwright, you know, this awareness about the craft of writing a play, this is known, this is a, an, an aspect of meta theatre, okay. making self references, uh, being self referential, being self conscious about oneself, about one's art, about one's craft. That is one aspect of meta theatre and we will discuss it further soon. Story, goodbye then, we must be going. Man, wait, do not go please. Uh, I suppose I have no choice to the audience. So, now you know why this play is being done. I have no choice. Bear with me please, as you can see, it is a matter of life and death for me. Karnad is, you know, making a very self-conscious attempt here, referring to himself. It is a play writing is a matter of life and death for any playwright. There is no getting away with that. You do not have a choice. For A writer does not really have a choice. He has to write. A story has to be told. A play has to be written. Whether the audience receives it well or not, um, it really does not matter. Okay, because for a playwright, for a writer, uh, it is a matter of his life and death. It, it has to come out. Musicians play, please. Musicians enter and occupy their mat. The story and the song. Throughout the rest of the play, the man and the story remain on stage. So, this is again a very Brechtian element. The, the narrator, the storyteller, the, the so called playwright, they remain on the stage throughout um, the play. The flames too listen attentively, uh, though from a distance go on and the main story begins. So, now the prologue has just ended and the story begins, act 1. The locked front door of a house with a yard in front of the house, a very typical village setup and on the right an enormous ant hill. Ant hill is a place you know where snakes reside. The interior of the house, the kitchen, the bathroom as well as Rani's room is clearly seen. Story, now this story is telling us the setting. She is talking about who the actors are, who are the uh, principal characters in this play. A young girl, her name is, it does not matter, it could be any woman, but she was an only daughter, so her parents called her Rani. Queen, queen of the wo whole world, queen of the long treases, for when her hair was tied up in a knot, it was as though a black king cobra lay curled on the nape of her neck coil upon glistening coil. When it hung loose, the trees flowed. A torrent of black along her young limbs and got entangled in her silver anklets. Her fond father found her a suitable husband. The young man was rich and his parents were both dead. Rani continued to live with her parents until she reached womanhood. Soon her husband came and took her with him to his village. His name was, well, um, any common name will do. So, it is a story about any man. See, this is another uh, aspect of the play. Any man. 
or every man. So, that suggests that uh, it is a very common uh, kind, kind of a, a you know household and they could be anyone. It is a very there is a you know, touch of you know, universality about them. Um, Apanna, let us call him Apanna, that means that any man, every man. Apanna, Apanna enters followed by Rani and they carry bundles in their arms indicating that they have been travelling. Apanna opens the lock on the front door of the house, they go in. Have you brought in all the bundles? Yes, well then I will be back tomorrow at noon. Keep my lunch ready, I shall eat and go. Rani looks at him nonplussed. He pays no attention to her, goes out, shuts the door, locks it from outside and goes away. She runs to the door, pushes it, finds it locked. So, he locks her from outside. It also tells us that he is a very indifferent, uh, uh, uncaring husband. She does not know what is happening. She stands perplexed. She cannot even weep. She goes and sits in a corner of her room, talking to herself indistinctly. Her words become distinct as the lights dim. It is night. So, Rani asks him, where are you taking me? And the eagle answers, beyond the seven seas and the seven isles. On the seventh island is a magic garden and in that garden stands the tree of emeralds. Under that tree, your parents wait for you. So, Rani says, do they? Then please, please take me to them immediately. Here I come. So, the eagle carries her clear across the seven seas. Now, see uh, this is the power of stories, she is all alone and even her, uh, in, in her loneliness, she can recall a story that must have been told to her by her parents, by the elders of her family and she remembers it and he, there is no way for, no other way for her to uh, spend these you know lonely hours, um, but to recall. Uh, and keep herself occupied by remembering or retelling those stories. So, again we are looking at the power of uh, uh, a folk tale, a power of a story that has been uh, you know, transferred from one generation to another. Okay. So, uh, stories have a power not just to entertain, but also uh, the strength to heal and that is what Karnad is trying to tell us. She falls asleep, uh, moans, oh mother, father in her sleep. It gets light and she wakes up with a fright, looks around then runs to the bathroom, mimes splashing water on her face, goes into the kitchen, starts cooking. Now, mimes splashing water on her face, again a very Brechtian technique, miming an activity, okay, uh, not actually splashing water, but miming it. So, just uh, creating that, you know, the just that touch of um, distance between the um, happenings on the stage and the audience. Mm -hmm. The audience are uh, fully aware that they are watching a play. Okay. They do not want, uh, you know, they are not supposed to get involved with the happenings of the play, that they are, they have to think and that is what Brush tells us and that is what Karnad, Karnad being an ardent admirer of Brush, he uses this technique in order to force his uh, audience to think rather than get emotionally involved. Um, Apanna returns, Rani listen, um, I feel frightened alone at night. Apanna, what is there to be scared of? Just keep to yourself, no one will bother you. Please uh, you could uh, look, I do not like idle chatter, do as you are told. You understand, he is very rude to her, um, absolutely uh, inattentive to her needs, to what she has to say. He finishes his meal, gets up. I will be back tomorrow for lunch. Apanna washes his hands, locks her in and goes away. Rani watches him uh, blankly through the window and then story says and so the days rolled by. So, this, this became Rani's life. She had an, uh, an uncaring, inattentive husband who uh, really is not there. He comes just for his uh, uh, meals at regular intervals, but that is it. There is no other communication between them. Mechanically, Rani goes into the kitchen, starts cooking, talks to herself. Then Rani's parents embrace her and cry. They kiss her and caress her 
at nights, she sleeps between them. So, we now learn that she is a pampered child. She even after attaining womanhood, she used to sleep uh, between her parents. She has been extremely protected and now she, suddenly she is thrown into this alien environment and this uncaring husband and she is scared, she cannot cope with it. So, she is not frightened anymore, do not worry, they promise her, we will not let you go away uh, again ever. In the morning, the song, stag with the golden antlers comes to the door, he calls out to Rani, she refuses to go. I am not a stag, he explains, I am a prince. So, she has been fed on this uh, diet of uh, uh, myths, legends and st fairy tales and that is what she imagines, sits there imagining, thinking of the stories, think of, thinking of the good old times when life was, was like a dream, you know, just like a fairy tale for her. Rani sits staring blankly into the oven, then begin to sob. Outside in the street, Kapanna enters carrying Kurudava on his shoulder. So, we have another two characters, you know, they also, uh, they can be seen as, uh, you know, comic interludes, also uh, commentators on what is going on in the play. Uh, Kurudava is blind, he uh, is in his early twenties, so mother and son. Kapanna, mother you cannot do this, you cannot start meddling in other people's affairs the first thing in the morning. That Apanna should have been born a wild beast or a reptile, by some mistake he got a human birth, he cannot stand other people, what do you want to tangle with him? So, they are on their way to Apanna's house and Kapanna obviously does not like uh, Apanna. Uh, Kurudava, whatever he is, he is the son of my best friend, his mother and I were like sisters. Poor thing, she died bringing him into this world. Now, a new daughter-in-law comes to her house. I can, how can I go on as though nothing has happened? Besides, I have not slept a wink, you told me. You saw Apanna in his concubine's courtyard. So, now we, we are told that now we know the reason for Appanna's indifference to his wife. He has got himself a bride and he still goes after that harlot. I knew I should not have told you, now you have insomnia and I have a backache, I have to carry you all the way. Who has asked you to carry me around like this? I have not, have I? I was born and brought up here, I can find my way around. And do you know what I ask for when I pray to Lord Hanuman of the gymnasium every morning? For more strength, not to wrestle, not to fight, only so I can carry you around. So, Kapanna happens to be a very sincere, very uh, obedient son, uh, a very loyal son. So, he is an ideal kind of a son uh, that we are told, you know, in our, in our uh, mythologies and in our legends. And, he knows his mother is blind, but he would not let her walk, he carries her around. Okay, so, that is another you know idealized, uh, you know ideal of a son, an idealized character. It is uh, Kapanna now, it is just that I can see Appanna's front door from here. Oh, uh, for a moment I was uh, worried it was that, who is that again, the, that witch or fairy whatever she is, uh, who you say follows you around. Mother, she is not a witch or a fairy. When I try to explain, you will not even listen. And then, when I am not even thinking of her, you start suspecting all kinds of, uh, enough of her now. Tell me, why we have stopped? Kapanna, there does not seem to be anyone in Appanna's house. There is a lock on the front door. Kurudava, how is that possible? Even if he is lying in his concubine's house, his bride should be home. Um, who can tell about Appanna? He is a lunatic. You do not think he should have sent his wife back to her parents already, do you? Come, let us look in through the window and check. Uh, of course not, mother. If someone sees us, listen to me. Go up to the house and peep in. Tell me what you see. I refuse. I would not have asked you if I had eyes. I do not know why God has been cruel to me, why he gave me no sight. Kapanna, okay mother, they go near the house. Kapanna peers through the window. Kapanna, the house is empty. Uh, of course, it is silly. How can anyone be inside when there is a lock outside on the door? 
Tell me, can you see clothes drying inside? What kind of clothes? I can't see a thing. Who is it? Uh, what is that outside? Oh my God! Uh, there's someone inside the house, a woman. You don't have to tell me that. So what if there's a woman inside the house? We have come here precisely because a woman is supposed to be in the house. Mother, what does it mean when a man locks his wife in? It means he does not want anyone to talk to his wife. Rani comes, you know, she hears all these noises and she comes out and she comes to the door and asks, who is it? Kapanna, let us go. Kurudava, I am coming child, right now. He keeps his wife locked up like a caged bird. I must talk to her, let me down instantly. I will wait for you on here under the tree, come back soon, do not just sit there gossiping. Rani, who are you? Do not be afraid, I am Kurudava. So, now you have a sympathetic character and uh, you know Kurudava's and uh, uh, Kapanna's characters, they are there to create a sort of uh, you know conflict in the play. You know what is a conflict, you know so Rani's life has days rolled by, it, it was static. It, the, nothing much happened in her life. Um, her husband from, uh, uh, you know, he would return from his uh, mistress's house, take his meals, wash himself and then go back locking Rani in. Nothing was, nothing changed in her uh, life. You know, her days were all monotonous. And then through Kapan, uh, through Kapanna and Kurudava, there is a change in her life. Because, because they want to know what is happening. Where is Apanna? I do not know. When did he go out? After lunch yesterday. When will he come back? Yeah, he will be back for lunch later in the day. Uh, you do not mean he is home only once a day and that too only for lunch? Are you alone in the house all day? Do not cry child, do not cry. I, have, I have not come here to make you cry. Does he lock you up every day like this? Yes, since the day I came here. Does he beat you or ill treat you? No. Does he talk to you? Oh, oh uh, that he does not, but not a syllable, syllable more than required. Do this, do that, serve the food. Um, the Kurudava is concerned. Apart from him, you are the first person I have seen since coming here. I am bored to death. There is no one to talk to. That is not what I meant by talk. Uh, okay. mm. Did not anyone explain to you before your wedding, your mother or your aunt? Mother started shedding tears the day I matured and she was still crying when I left with my husband. She is probably even cry crying even now. Uh, Kurudava, dear girl, it is no use crying, do not cry. Um, come to the window, let me touch you. My eyes are all in my fingers. She feels Rani's face, shoulder, neck through the bars of the window. Rani tells her, uh, at home, I sleep between father and mother, but here alone. Kurudava, can you help me please? Will you please send a word to my parents that I am like this here? Will you ask them to free me and take me home? I would jump into a well, if only I could. Uh, Kurudava wants to take matters in her hand, because she believes that Rani uh, can go to any drastic lengths. To, you know, to get to, to free herself from her situation. She knows obviously Rani is very happy, very frightened and extremely alone. So, uh, she calls her son and asks him, um, you know, uh, go and go home and bring some roots. Just above where you keep the plow be behind the, um, the pillar on the shelf, there is an old tin tr uh, trunk, take it down, it is full of odds and ends. But take out the bundle of cloth, untie it, inside there is a wooden box. Uh, in the right hand side of the wooden box is a coconut shell wrapped up in a piece of paper. Inside are two pieces of a root, bring them. Now at once, before Apanna returns home. And then, uh, after sending uh, Kapanna off, she tells, Kurudava tells her story, what is the secret of the roots. Mm, I was born blind, no one would marry me. 
my father wound himself out going from village to village looking for a husband, but to no avail. One day a mendicant came to our house, no one was home, I was alone. I looked after him in every way, cooked hot food especially for him and served him to his heart's content. He was pleased with me and gave me three pieces of a root. Any man who eats one of these will marry you, he said. And then, feed him the smallest piece first, he said. If that gives no results, then try the middle sized one. Only if both fail, feed him the largest piece. Rani is entranced. Uh, and then, one day a boy distantly related to me came uh, to our village and stayed with us. That day I ground one of the pieces into paste, mixed it in with the food and served him. Can you guess which piece I chose? I was in such a hurry, I barely noticed the small one, the biggest scared me. So, I used the middle size root. And then, he finished his meal, gave me one look and instantly fell in love, married me within the next two days, never went back to his village. It took the plague to detach him from me. So, that is how, that is the magic uh, of that uh, root, you know, which has been blessed by a mendicant. So, uh, our, uh, our oral tradition, our legends and myths, they are full of such stories, you know, we are talking about the probable impossibilities and we have to believe that there is, you know, uh, in Shakespeare for example, Midsummer Night's Dream, we have um, Puck's juice, the love juice which uh, uh, is dropped on the eyelids of um, the characters and whoever they see first after uh, waking up, they fall in love with that particular person. So, uh, the same way, same way we have to accept this as well, uh, by having a root of a, uh, of some certain plant, you, you know, love happens. Ha, there he is, have you brought them? Here, take this smaller piece, that should do for a pretty jasmine like you. Take it, grind it into a nice paste and feed it to your husband and watch the results. He will make you a wife instantly. Go now Kurudava, but come again. I shall do, but do not forget what I told you. Apanna comes. Who is that? Kurudava. Mm, Kurudava, how are you Apanna? It has been a long time. What are you doing here? So, he is, you know, his, his customary rude, uh, customarily rude to everyone and that is what we see. Uh, I heard you had brought a new bride, thought I would talk to her, but she refuses to come out. She will not talk to anyone and no one need talk to her, if you say so. I put a lock on the on those, uh, so those with sight could see. Now, what does one do about blind meddlers? I think I will keep a watch dog. Opens the door and goes into Rani. I am lunching out today. I will have my bath and go, just heat up a glass of milk for me. Rani uh, hurriedly mixes the paste into the milk, comes out and gives Apanna the glass of milk. He drinks it um, in a, a single gulp, hands the glass back to her, goes to the door ready to put the lock on. She watches him uh, intently, he tries to shut the door, suddenly clutches his head, slides down to the floor stretches out and goes to sleep on the doorstep, half inside and half outside the house. Rani is distraught, runs to him, shakes him, he does not wake up, he is in a deep sleep. She tries to drag him into the house, but he is too heavy for her. She sits down and starts crying, um, Appana groggily, water, water. She brings a pot of water, splashes it on his face, he wakes up slowly, staggers up, washes his face, pushes her in, locks, her, locks the door from outside, goes away. Rani watches, stunned, slowly goes back to her bedroom, starts talking to herself. So, the demon locks her up in his castle, then it rains for seven days and seven nights, it pours, the sea floods the city, the waters break down the door of the castle, then a big whale comes to Rani and says, come Rani, let us go. She falls asleep, midnight, Kapana enters carrying Kurudava, stumbles on a stone, they fall. So, again she takes resort, she takes refuge in her old stories. 
you know, we are all familiar with uh, the stories of uh, princesses being um, uh, captured and uh, imprisoned in castles by demons. So, that is what now she associates her uh, husband with a demon, you know, you know with, with a monster who locks, who, who's, you know, who takes pleasure in torturing her, locking her up. So, that is what she thinks of her husband as. And the root of course, you know, does not have an much effect, effect on, um, on the husband. Uh, Kurudava, she comes, uh, what happened child, why is the lock still there, did you feed him the root, yes, and what happened, mm, nothing, he felt giddy, fainted, then got up and left, that is bad, this is no ordinary infa infatuation then. Now, there is only one solution to this, feed him the larger piece of root. No, that uh, little piece made him sick, this one, it will do good, believe me. Mm, I am telling you from my own experiences, go in, start grinding it, make a tasty curry, pa mix the paste in it, let him taste a spoonful and he will be your slave. And then, just say the word and he will carry you to my house, to my house himself. So, obviously, he is under the spell of his mistress and he does not want to give her up that easily. The root does not have any effect on Apanna, the small piece just does not work on him. So, next morning Kurudava comes again and asks Grani this time to give her the larger piece and we will see what happens after that in the, in the next class. Thank you.